At its very core, drug science must remain independent. This means we don't accept sponsorships. It's with the support of the drug science community we're able to do this and make the podcast in the first place. If you're able to become a drug science community member and support the show, you too will be supporting the dissemination of evidence-based drug policies. Without you, none of this would be possible. For anybody interested, there's a link in the show notes. Thank you. Hello and welcome to the Drug Science Podcast with me, David Nutt. Here we're bringing together experts and activists for a rational, honest and informed conversation about drugs. Well, hello and welcome to another Drug Science Podcast. And today I have with me someone that many of you won't have heard of before. She's called Dr. Teresa, it's Professor, I think, Teresa Mata, And she is an expert in nudge theory. And I'm going to hand over to her. Hello, Teresa. How are you? Hello, Dave. I'm very well, thank you. Great. So why don't you just introduce yourself? I'd like people to say a little bit about their background and how they got to become professors. Do you want to tell us a little bit about, you know, what brought you into psychology, I think, and what you've done up to this point? Yes. So I'm the director of the Behaviour and Health Research Unit at the University of Cambridge. And how did I get uh, involved in psychology? What, what pulled me in? I'm not too sure. So I applied to university to read psychology for both I think negative and positive reasons, uh, negative reasons in that I knew that I wasn't that interested in pursuing my A-level subjects at university, zoology, sociology, economic history, and uh, curious about people and in particular relationships, social relationships. So my first degree was in social psychology at the London School of Economics. Oh, you were revolutionary, were you? <laughs> well, actually, I, I, oh, no, I no, you're not old enough. You're not my age. Sorry, apologies. You're not my age. <laughs> I, I missed the protest. Uh, it's just just a few a few years uh, after that, so 1972. And I was going to say it was a very exciting time in social psychology. In the this is the time when Milgram experiments was a, were coming through. And social psychology was uh, particularly influenced by a group of psychologists, mainly based in, in the States, who were focused on trying to understand man's inhumanity to man, how it was that during, in the period of uh, Nazi Germany, such atrocious things happened. And so a lot of uh, Milgram, Schachter, uh, many of those uh, very eminent social psychologists were working on experiments to try to understand what it was about, if, if you like, sort of very crudely, the extent to which it's bad people or people in particular contexts behaving in the way that, that they did. Actually, I'm not sure all of my listeners many of whom are quite young now, uh, know who Milgram was. Do you want to just give us a, a very brief sort of overview of the, that remarkable experiment, which still stands as a sort of, a, you know, the worst example of humans inability to say no, that I guess there is in experimental psychology. So these were a series of experiments um, in which people were invited to take part in what they thought were going to be experiments in learning. And so an individual would sit in one part of the lab and they were told that there was somebody else taking part in the experiment. He was having to learn, I think it was paired associates and every time, and, and it was an experiment in, in learning and every time they failed to recall what the correct associated word was, then they were to deliver uh, an electric shock and the more errors the individual made, so the higher the electric shock was that they would deliver. And what uh, transpired, I can't remember the figures now, but a very large number of people who were taking part in the experiment would continue to deliver these shocks on the instructions of the experimenter, despite the fact that they could hear people shouting, screaming, wailing, uh, you know, hitting, hitting the walls next door. 
And one of the, and there were variants on that theme. And what it, uh, what it highlighted was the book is called Obedience to Authority, is how despite people feeling incredibly uncomfortable about what they were asked to do, many of them did continue and continue to the point of believing that the person where, when they became silent might indeed have uh, received a, a fatal shock. Wow. I hadn't realised it had gone that far, actually. Well, I think it was, but I could have misremembered that. But I, I think that's the gist of the experiment. And there, there were many other experiments that, that were conducted, as I say, really highlighting that uh, the social context in which much of our behaviour occurs, and that's uh, obviously very negative behaviour, but also positive behaviours, is shaped by context or environment. And I, I think that certainly in terms of my more recent work uh, over the last, well, I suppose 10, 20 years, it's very much focused on context or environment and how that shapes our behaviour. So it's a theme to which I've returned, having had a bit of a detour in the middle. Oh, where did you go in your detour? Oh, well, <laughs> um, I mean, in terms of the content of my work. So as I say, in the, the 70s and the 80s, social psychology, very much one of the themes anyway that, that I took away was about the importance of context or situation on our behaviour. And I then conduct, uh, then started a PhD after I trained in, in clinical psychology, very much focused on individuals understanding of risk, perceptions of risk, and then moved into the communication of risk as a way of trying to motivate people to change their behavior. And spent many years and uh, quite a few MRC and welcome grants exploring that. Was that at LSE as well? No, 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 no. So I've moved away from LSE. I went to Oxford and took a master's in what was called abnormal psychology at that time. And uh, that was that was part of training as a clinical psychologist. Uh -huh. That was in Oxford for a couple of years working as a clinical psychologist. And I then realized that that wasn't for me. I was much more interested in research and then started a PhD and which was focused on um, risk perception. Yeah, well, of course, risk perception is something that's extremely close to drug sciences uh, research agenda. I mean, we've done uh, quite a lot of assessments of, of comparative relative risk of different drugs, but getting the politicians to actually understand uh, the, those comparative differences is actually quite challenging. Then perhaps we should have come to you earlier. Well, I don't, I don't know. I don't know about that because risk, as you know, uh, is multifaceted, and I think that. Probably some of the work that you were involved with did have a large value laden component dolloped on top, which is where some of the problems might have occurred. So the risk, maybe we can come back to that. So the line of research that I followed was very much an interest in the extent to which if uh, people understood the risks to themselves that their own behavior would entail, not necessarily immediately, but in the longer term, would that motivate them to change their behavior? And I was particularly interested in risks to, to health and in particular, you know, the, the major diseases that uh, uh, lead to premature death and um, disability of type two diabetes, numerous cancers, heart disease, and I was starting to look at this, first of all, in Oxford, and then I moved to London at the time when there was a lot of excitement about genetics and the new genetics and the possibility that we might be able to test uh, people to um, be able to give them a more precise estimate of the likelihood that they might develop one of these more common conditions. And the, the central conceit, I mean, there were very high expectations that being given this in, information, you know, revealing that which is invisible would um, have a, a novel component. It would change people's attitudes towards the risk information that they were being given. And that would be more potent than um, just general risk information, you know, 
smoking increases your chances of lung cancer and so on. So, well, um, the answer is with a certain amount of uncertainty, no. So pretty much a, a, a flat line, but, um, but that's, you know, I'm condensing lots of grants, lots of studies into one sentence there. It's a, the getting to that bottom line and many people don't think that the, that there is enough evidence to draw that conclusion that, uh, on average, providing people with information, whether based on DNA or other biological markers about the risks that their own behavior poses for developing a, a condition many years, hence reduce it, well, does not change their behavior to reduce those risks. Gosh, that was a very long and windy sentence. Um, no, no, it's, <laughs> but it's, yes, it always struck me. It's just the Huntingdon story, you know, where you, where you actually kind of know, you can know if you've got the risk gene or not. But so many people don't want to know. I mean, I, don't, I just was wondering to what extent genes add value. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I think that that's a different context. So, um, so the con I, I did do some studies that were looking at some of the genetic testing for conditions for which uh -huh. in the main there was nothing that people could do to mitigate those risks. But that's different to the conditions that I most interested in. So as I say, they are the common chronic conditions like type 2 diabetes, like many cancers. And so the typical studies, either that I was involved in running or included in several systematic literature reviews, involved, say, taking a group of people who might be at increased risk because of their age and their weight of developing type 2 diabetes, running them through different risk assessments that might include a genetic marker, it might include a non-genetic biological marker, or they might just be given information that said, as people get older and if they put on weight, they will increase their risk of developing this. And then they're all given the same advice uh, to become physically active and um, maybe maintain a healthy weight. And then comparing across the groups, there is no difference depending on whether or not the risk has been a precise estimate based on either genotype or some aspect of phenotype compared to just giving people the advice. Yeah, I got it. I got it. So uh, people have then become interested in, well, maybe it is that the risk of not being communicated uh, in the most elaborate way. Maybe people aren't at high enough risk for this to have an effect. Either threat isn't big enough. I think my, my reading of it is that we are exquisitely sensitive to risk information. If you look at a beach that's got a sign up saying sharks, um, there are very few people who can see. <laughs> um, if you're true. giving people information about uncertain events uh, way down the track and you're asking them to substitute something that's pleasurable, whether it's uh, up or, or, or food, then that the, the risk information uh, is not enough to lead to a sense of imminent threat. But I think that for me, I, the, the largest factor in here is that it's our environments, it's our context that has the strongest effect on the behaviours that I've been interested in, which include uh, excessive consumption of alcohol and smoking, as well as excessive consumption of food, physical inactivity. So for those behaviours, which tend to be routine, habitual, impulsive, it's in the main, it's not driven by a sense of threat. It's cued by our everyday environments. And so the results of our systematic reviews, which were telling us there's no signal from giving people risk information, however fancy it is, however precise it is. So there isn't a signal from that. So if you are interested in changing behavior, um, look at those cues in people's environments that make it more likely that they behave in a way that undermines their health. And I guess that's 
there was some progress initially in that in, with smoking by banning advertising because Brazilian advertising is one of the the great drivers of uh, consumptive behaviour. But uh, we haven't even managed to progress that. Yes. We haven't ban it, managed to ban ban advertising of alcohol or fatty foods, have we? But at least we've made some progress with nicotine or tobacco, rather. We have. That's absolutely right. So I'm being very uh, broad in using the term new or environments that shape our behavior. So I'm thinking that at any one time, we are being shaped by multiple overlapping environments. So I'm thinking that the economic environment, so price uh, is, is one set of cues, as well as the availability in physical space of, of, of these, these products, as well as the social environment and, and digital environment. So uh, thinking about smoking, as you say, we have made um, some progress uh, in rates of smoking have gone down, um, depending on where you're looking in the world, um, there has been significant reduction. But there was a, a report out, I think it was a Lancet report last week, that, uh, of course, the world population has grown. So um, we've now got, we've never had so many people smoking cigarettes. It's uh, over a billion people. So yeah, I was actually staggered by that uh, Lancet report the other day because I, up till now, I, I teach every year on the global health course in uh, Imperial. I, I teach one lecture and I say to the students, you say, you, you'll probably come to this course thinking you're going to cure the world of dengue and malaria and tuberculosis. And you will in your lifetime, you know, in another 30 or 40 years, you will. But uh, then what's going to be left? What's going to be left are the diseases of addiction, tobacco and alcohol. And I was, you know, and I normally say there's five and a half million premature deaths from tobacco. And last week, the Lancet told me it was over eight million. So I have to go and change my slides. And uh, it's such a disappointment, given the fact we've known for 50 years what to do about it. I know. I know. I think it was also in that article that they pointed out that there are a uh, hundred million livelihoods tied up in the tobacco industry. So there's the power of the industry. And there's also the power that they have over governments. Yeah, absolutely. Well, of course, uh, some of them are governments. I think the Chinese government's the largest manufacturer of cigarettes in the world, which is an interesting conflict of interest. Yeah, to put it, to put it mildly. Yeah. Well, we've survived it. I mean, Britain, we did, we did get rid of tobacco advertising and we did manage to get... Um, People smoking outdoors rather than indoors, which is a you know an unquestionably good thing, but we've we've really struggled to move drinking and overeating in the same direction. So, in your you know your more recent reincarnation as, as a head of this research unit, what what are your takes on that? I think there's pretty much a consensus that tobacco has no uh, no brings brings no benefits. And when we've looked at, at studies looking at public acceptability of tobacco control policies, invariably they're very high. So we've got public on board there and governments, although, uh, as, as we've just discussed, um, certainly the policies need to be tightened up. And I think we could look at Australia, which is probably way, way out there in terms of the policies that they have increasing the price on a regular basis, standardised packaging of tobacco and so on. So we have got examples of where countries are uh, forging ahead and hopefully others will follow. But for alcohol, it's so much part of our culture, isn't it? Um, that there's enormous ambivalence about reducing consumption of alcohol. And the other thing that has struck me as a behavioural scientist is how there's research, I don't, I don't know, you can help me in terms of thinking about mapping out the research in a field. So this is brought home to me in, we, we conducted a, a Cochrane review in 2015, in which we looked at one of the cues that can affect people's behaviour, which is size. And so in this review, we were looking, we were asking the question, what is the impact on selection and consumption of food, alcohol and tobacco of 
the size of portions, packages, and tableware. So a bit weird to have tableware in the title with tobacco. But anyway, you get the gist. Yeah. Yeah, what, what, is, what is the impact on selection and consumption? And what we'd be particularly interested in looking at is looking at these cues across these three products that are very harmful to health. And in that review, we found 72 experiments that had compared larger versus smaller portion package or, or tableware across those, those mm -hmm. three products. Mm -hmm. So 72, 69 concerned food, three, <laughs> three concerned tobacco, some very dodgy, you, you know, very poor quality studies conducted in the 80s looking at length of cigarettes and zero studies concerned alcohol. So in 2015, there were no studies in the public domain that are compared the impact of different sizes of container, larger versus smaller bottles or cans, serving sizes, you know, one pint versus two third pint or glass, nothing. And then you went on and did the experiment, I gather. <laughs> well, we went on. And uh, of course, it's just a beginning. So we've done a, a number of, of, of studies looking at glassware in relation to wine, bottle size in relation to wine, and serving size in relation to both wine and beer. And that's been, well, fascinating as a scientist being able to <laughs> generate the evidence. And it's also thrown up some of the, well, some of the difficulties that there are in trying to conduct these studies in what I would say are field, field settings. Well, tell us about both. Tell us, uh, tell us about the difficulties first and then tell us about your findings because they are, I think, uh, well, a, a fascinating and be also relevant to, to policy change. So. I mean, the challenges were, were, I guess, just going into bars was it, or pubs in the evening and doing experiments. No, no, no. Uh, so researchers uh, don't don't run the experiments at all. I mean, that's the beauty ah. of the experiment. Um, so it depends which study. So if if I take you know, the first set of um, studies, well, where we started was wine glasses. So having seen that there is a very clear. Uh, portion size effect in relation to food from those 69 experiments. So basically, the larger the portion, the serving in front of you, the more you'll eat, um, often without awareness. So that's one of the important things that this is happening. We're being cued to consume more without our awareness. So what we wanted to do was to find bars where they would be willing to serve alcohol using different size wine glasses. So we thought wine glasses were easier to start with. Um, Absolutely. Because, yeah. So it was a real struggle to find a bar that would collaborate. And I think often the concern is we might be uh, reducing their sales. So it was only through conversation with someone in the university who had to co own a bar <laughs> you should make universities do it because they they have subsidized which is done it you should do it in the houses of parliament of course but they have subsidized bars. well yes, we, we had thought about that but um we didn't need to go that far so this was a a, a commercial bar uh the pint shop so it is in the public domain that uh, this this colleague introduced us to the manager we went along and they were open to this they had been thinking about changing the wine glasses that they were using to serve wine, both in the restaurant and the bar area. And we were offering, uh, so they were selling wine at the time in glasses that had the capacity of 300 milliliters. And what we were interested in doing was buying them a, a set of glass glassware that was the same design, but one size up, which was 370 millimetre, and one size down, which was, um, I think, 270. And so the design we had was a, a sort, of, sort of almost like a crossover design, but with, with multiple points. And so each fortnight, they would sell wine, either in the standard, their standard glass, and then 
the next two weeks they'd serve it in small, then the next two weeks in the larger and so on. So multiple treatment reversal design. And I think we had eight, I can't now remember, I think it was sort of eight uh, periods of, of crossing over. And so the researchers don't go in, we delivered the wine glasses see, to nice. them and they changed, they changed over on a Sunday night every fortnight. And they're just looking at uh, the volume of what we, we then, they gave us the data and we looked at the volume of wine that was sold. And uh, to cut to the chase, they increased uh, the volume of wine sold by 9.4% 9 9 when using the larger glasses compared to the standard size. So there was a lot of interest in this at the time. And uh, the Wall Street Journal ran ran a piece on it as, you know, they like to do lighthearted articles and they interviewed the manager. And uh, he, he then said, I hadn't realized it at the time, that although he said it wasn't the intention of uh, the researchers from the University of Cambridge, um, they they found it really helpful and they removed the, the standard size glasses. Standard size glasses. So so far, all we've managed to do, I think, is to increase uh, alcohol consumption. We then we then went on and repeated that study because, as you know, one study isn't enough, and we brought together. A data a data sets from I think it's uh, eight different settings of yeah eight eight data sets into what's called a mega analysis and what that showed was a reliable effect of um, an increase in volume sold of in the end it was seven point three percent but only in restaurant areas so it looks like it's when people free pour. So poor. Uh -huh. yes, that's of course quite an important so variable. Bottle. So we mm. just we finished a lab study where we ran. So this was we had to close early because of the pandemic. But in the lab um, study, we had people free pour from bottles of different sizes into glasses of different sizes, and there was a very clear effect of uh, people pour more into larger glasses. I mean, you might think it's self-evident that it's important to you to establish that. So. Of course, the estimates that we have, you know, it is just a difference between the 370 and the 300. So that signal is coming through. So then there's a question of, well, what, what do you do with that? Because the evidence isn't, probably isn't strong enough to withstand a legal challenge. Oh, you mean you might have, what kind of legal challenge might you be thinking of? Oh, uh, so uh, we're, we're very responsible researchers. So the Home Office were aware that we were doing this research and we talked to the local authorities who grant licenses. So the intervention that we would imagine uh, could happen is while we've got very clear regulation around the serving size for wine, which goes back centuries and also for, for beer, weights and measures, um, we don't have any regulation on the size of glasses. And one thing we do know from a student project that got slightly out of hand, where we looked at the size of wine glasses in England between 1700 and 2017. Uh -huh. And uh, what I can tell you is um, probably... They've got bigger. <laughs> they have got bigger. You're absolutely right. And... What we also know, because uh, the Royal Household allowed us to look at their complete wine uh, wine glass collection for a 200 period, um, that we were able to overcome um, the problem with looking at museum collections, which is the larger glasses are more fragile and are more likely to break. Whereas in the royal household, there's a new set of wine glasses that are created, blown for each monarch. And ah. if they're chipped or broken, they are replaced. Well, hello, listeners. Uh, apologies for the interruption to the show, but I have a very exciting piece of news to share with you. In December, I will be releasing my brand new book, The Brain and Mind Made Simple. Now, this is a book which has been developed from lectures I gave for drug science over the last couple of years before COVID. They went down very well. I discovered that people were very interested in their brain and very interested in their mind, and also interested in the way that drugs, both legal and illegal, cast light on those and, and affect them. So if you're interested in your brain at all, this book 
will take you from the very beginnings of you know when we're in the back in the primordial days when the uh, the first animals were developing a nervous system right through into the current ways in which we can study the brain with imaging it also give you insights into what goes wrong in the brain and there are chapters on all the different ways in which processes of consciousness and the content of consciousness can change with disorders such as depression anxiety schizophrenia and also a big section on sleep as well because that's a fascinating component of brain function which is not well understood now the book will support drug science and in the same way as my previous book um, not uncut did and to celebrate the launch of the book we're hosting a book launch in London. And this will be one of the first real life events I've done in the past 18 months. And we're very excited to see listeners of the podcast in person at this event. So if you can make your way to London, we'd love to see you there. And of course, uh, you'll be able to buy the book and you'll have a, get a signed copy from me. But obviously, many of the uh, podcast listeners are from overseas and we don't want you to miss out. So we'll also uh, host an online book launch as well. Um, if you follow us on the website, you'll know when that's going to be. And again, if you join our community, you'll be able to get special signed copies and also other access to other drug science events I'm taking part in. So now, back to the show. So you, th you were thinking you could persuade Cambridge Authority to say, do they have that authority? Could they say, the local council say you can't serve anything more than a 150 mil glass or something? Well, say for the license agreement, it's possible that it could be added. Uh, the the size, it, it, this is all in theory. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say the size in which the wine is served. So going back to what we found, uh, as as you said, wine glasses had grown and they've grown sort of almost sevenfold. Um, we were at a very a long period of time, but they grew, uh, not grew, but um, they increased in size rather, particularly around the 1990s. So in the 1990s, they were on average 230 milliliters. So that's the complete capacity. Yep, yep. Whereas in 2017, and this is looking not at the palace, but at John Lewis catalogue, it's 450 milliliters. So it's just shy of half a liter. <laughs> That's more than half a bottle. <laughs> that is exactly right. Now, now, of course, you and I know you don't fill your glass right up to the top, but if we go back to the 80s in this country, then the average wine glass was around 200 milliliters. If you, if you think about the Paris goblet, you know, sold in Habitat and other places, that was the standard wine glass. And now, you know, it's it's more than double. So certainly for, for licensed premises, it in theory, it would be possible to stipulate the size of wine glass, but there's, as I say, that, that more evidence is, is needed and it would be contested by the industry. This is the industry doing it, is it, rather than the, uh, the landlords? Well, they would be the ones who would go to court. Okay? No, I meant in terms of the expansion of glass volume. Oh, well, we don't, we don't know. We, uh -huh. we talked to the archivist at Dartington, Dartington Glass, and she thought that one of the influences was the American market. So they started to export to the States. Mm. Uh, in the 90s, and they wanted larger glasses. I mean, we, we don't want to blame it all on our American cousins, but that was one of the influences that came came. Um, you know, wine uh, glass is, is cheaper, so there's a variety right. of forces that have likely come come into play. I mean, the other, the other interesting component of size is bottles, wine bottles. Well, hang on, before you go there, Theresa, I just want to talk I want to make a couple of observations about yeah. glass sizes. So, you know, I, I was an undergraduate from 69, 72 in, in Downing, and all the wine there was served in these, I think, 125 mil glasses. And now you look at those and you think that's, that's not even a mouthful, right? Just, yeah. That's an insult. And so, we, you know, even someone like me who spent his whole life thinking about how we're being influenced to, yeah. to take more alcohol has been completely conditioned to think that a small glass is somehow an insult. So that's, it's a pervasive kind of uh, subconscious manipulation, isn't it? Yeah. But the other comments I wanted to make was, uh, I just finished a few weeks ago, we finished watching the series Big Little Lies. I don't know if you've seen it, about uh, 
women living on the uh, rather nice part of uh, Northern California. And um, there were two things. It's a Netflix series. And I thought, well, every as soon as it came up, it said, there are product placements in this series. And I thought, what are they? And then it became very obvious because every single time any woman, and they were mostly women, was drinking, was with a meal and drinking anything, they were drinking wine and they were drinking out of these 450 mil wine glasses. And it was absolutely, you know, there was, there was almost no instance of eating when they weren't drinking wine. And that's clearly product placement, trying to encourage people that you have to, to be like a, you know, a rich American, a yes. successful American woman. You've got to be drinking wine with every meal. Yes, absolutely. And some people argue that the larger the glass, of course, that is how you really appreciate a of good Of course, glass. of course. More bouquet. <laughs> so that's been one of the facts. Yeah. So I, I think you're absolutely right, Dave, that uh, this uh, rather like uh, portion sizes, drink, uh, well, thinking of sizes of um, soft drinks, um, sodas, coffee, um, all of it, uh, it's been supersized for us. And yes. going back to our sizing review of 2015, the extraordinary thing was that there was there was no research in the public domain on this at oh, that time. Staggering. So the other cue in relation to size and alcohol that we've been looking at has been wine bottle size. Yes, tell us about that. And it's probably one of the few products that if you go into a supermarket, most things come in different sizes. But if you look at wine bottles, they're nearly all in the same size, 75 centiliter. And I'm not sure uh, what, what the reason is for that. Well, anyway, it, it seems to be uh, pretty much universal that that is the bottle size. You can get non-premium, uh, sorry, premium wines in varying uh, bottle sizes. And I was really keen that we did an experiment where where we looked at smaller wine bottles. And I spent a long time trying to source non-premium 50 centiliter bottles because while you, you know half bottles they they are increasingly common not 50 centiliter ones and for a very brief moment in time i think it was m s was selling 50 centiliter non-premium okay. mm -hmm. and we we're about to start an experiment using those and then they they, they disappeared and then uh, for a wonderful uh, window, Tesco started to sell 50 centiliter non-premium wines. And we were then able, with the help of one of their wine buyers, to sort out exactly what it was they were selling. And without, we, we did not uh, collaborate with Tesco on this. Uh, we set up an experiment whereby it was a crossover design, we recruited just under 200 households that consumed between, oh gosh, what was it, four, uh, was it two and eight bottles of wine a week? Mm -hmm. And they agreed to purchase their wine for, I think it was a two or three week period, either in a uh, bottle size of 50 centiliter or in bottle sizes of 75 centimeters, and we randomized which order they would do it in. So that was published last year. So it's the first study worldwide <laughs> that has looked at I'm what sure is the impact on consumption of drinking from 50 centimeter versus 75 centimeter bottles. And what we found was that, yes, uh, it did reduce consumption by about 4.5%. And um, since then, Tesco have stopped selling those bottles. So we're re having to replicate that study, looking at the interaction, trying to look at the interaction between bottle size and wine glass size. Because, of course, wouldn't it be interesting to know if you're consuming from a smaller bottle into, and drinking with smaller glasses, might that have some sort of additive effect? Yes, indeed. No, you can imagine it would all go in the same direction. Yeah. What I do when I'm serving my best wine, uh, particularly my Sauternes, is I get out the really old fashioned sherry glasses, which are mm. tiny. I mean, just to make sure people don't guzzle it. 
Absolutely. I've I've bought some very small wine glasses since I've started doing <laughs> this, this research. So if people don't want much to drink, which, you know, sometimes one doesn't want much to drink, then to serve in tiny little glasses. If you, if you look at those films, uh, oh, well, I was thinking of War and Peace, when people are sitting around a table, they're drinking from tiny little glasses. And actually, uh, if you think about your embouchure, you know, how you approach a glass with your lips, the size of the sip, all of it is in one piece. It's actually quite hard to, to sip out of a 450ml wine glass, I find, because it tends to slurp and you're forced to take a big mouthful. <laughs> well, that's when you take out your straw or whatever it <laughs> might be. So with the wine bottles, I mean, it is just one... Uh, the, the study where we're looking at smaller, actually it's half size bottles with the smaller wine glasses, that, that experiment is still, we're still collecting the data for that. And what I've been interested in, what the policy implications of this might be. So first of all, there's a very interesting question about why is nobody selling 50 centiliter non-premium wines? And what I can tell you is that they don't fly off the shelves because we don't have proportionate pricing. Oh, well, that's the answer. And as with food, most of the, much of the cost of a bottle of wine is in the shipping and the glass and so on. It's not the content. So talking to people in policymakers, in theory, the policy intervention would be something to do with uh, pricing policy. So what it would be possible to shift the price so that it might be more advantageous to, to buy the 50 wine in smaller bottles rather than in the large ones. So there's, you know, there's a lot that policymakers can do. And again, one needs to think about there would be challenge. So the evidence has to be quite robust unless you're going to have a very robust government as there was in Australia with standardised packaging of tobacco. And they said, well, OK, threaten to, to sue us. We're going to do it anyway. I think they were sued by, I think, by Philip Morris, but I think, you know, the government won as it, as it yeah. inevitably will do, because it has a right, it has a right to make the laws. But let's move on to, on to obesity then, which of course is rapidly catching up with alcohol as a, a leading cause of, um, of health harms. I mean, well, you say that, I would just say that alcohol contributes to obesity. Yes. To the extent that, I mean, there, there are different estimates, but people who consume alcohol, it contributes between, I've seen estimates between 5 and 10% of their, their calorie intake. So it's always important. And often because policymakers work, work in silos, so there's uh, those who are focused on alcohol policy and those who are focused on obesity, the two don't come together. And I think it's really important that we do think about them together. One thing's for sure that uh, there's no calorie amount on any bottles of booze at present, which is, of course, a, another, another problem for that. Well, in the government's obesity plan, I think it was, it was the strategy that was published in July last year in the context of COVID. One of the interventions that a uh, government is going to consult on, and I'm not sure if the consultation has happened or whether it's been published, is putting calorie labels on alcohol. And certainly support that. Yeah. We're about to do an experiment uh, looking at that. So, looking at both health warning labels and using graphic images, in, in particular, warning people of the risks of uh, cancer, uh, cancers, uh, which the industry has been very keen to keep from public view. So looking at the impact of having graphic labels with warnings of um, cancer and heart disease, and to look separately and together at the impact of adding calories to alcohol. And again, one of the challenges of trying to do this work is uh, it's hard to find a commercial establishment um, that would accept selling their product. <laughs> Graphic uh, health warning of a Yes, that's right. 
and also to add the calorie labels. So we ran a sort of quasi lab based experiment using a shopper lab. I don't know. What is that? What is, I never heard of a shopper lab. So shopper lab is used by people doing market research, particularly retailers. So what, what you have are a couple of aisles that can be mocked up and then you invite people to come in and you don't give them a budget. And this is, I think one of the, well, uh, so people aren't spending their own money. So you come in, you give them a task and in the experiments that, that we ran, we gave them a task, which was to buy um, snacks and drinks for a weekend, I think it was. And a third of those, it was about 400 people we had coming into the, the shopper lab and a third of them, all the alcohol had different graphic warning labels that we had evaluated in an online study and found that uh, people were repelled by them and less likely to select alcohol if they saw them. So a third had had uh, the graphic uh, image as you have on tobacco with a, with a, a text warning. Others just had the text message and uh, the other third didn't have any of them. And we looked at the, the number of uh, alcohol products that, that they bought. Just say there was non alcohol there as well. So we weren't specifying by alcohol. There was, yep, alcohol. Yep. and we found a flat, a flat line, no difference between the groups at all. That was published, I think last week in addiction. And what we do, and, and that's a contrast to what we've seen in the online experiments where there is quite a, a dramatic effect. And what we don't know is whether it's to do with people not spending their own money and there's something just not ecologically valid about going around these, these labs. So because of the pandemic uh, and uh, not, uh, well, actually we, we, we haven't even asked the bar whether they would accept these labels. So the design we have for the study that we will start recruiting to shortly is that people are, are, are shown, they go to a website and we've mocked up an online supermarket and some of them will get the alcohol products with these labels, with or without calorie labels. And then uh, they will select and then we ask them to go immediately to the supermarket group that we've mocked up the products for and then purchase to see whether in that context with people buying from their own money, but it's it's still at one removed from having these labels. Yes, yeah, and until you, of course, until you get the evidence, the industry say there's no evidence. And one thing's for sure, they're not going to help you get the evidence, are they? So, <laughs> well, I don't know if you're familiar. There was a study in Canada a couple of years ago that was stopped by the industry. So, alcohol was declared it's a class one carcinogen in yes. 87 so over 30 years and there is only one country in the world that has a warning about cancer a specific health warning on uh, their labels that's um south korea and colleagues in canada started a, a study and it was stopped and the study was comparing um, standard warning labels that were uh, available in this state in Canada, I think to the safer drinking guidelines. And another label uh, included just a text message warning that alcohol can increase, is associated with an increased risk in uh, cancer of the breast, colon, and stomach, I think it was. So well, it was a very small study in that they just had one store where they implemented mm -hmm. those labels and a couple of other stores where they didn't implement the, those labels. And they were going to collect data for a period of time, um, some months, and they were stopped by the alcohol industry who claimed that there were legal problems with what they were doing. And in fact, in a subsequent analysis, the legal concerns were bogus. But they had expensive lawyers, I bet. Yes, I think that's absolutely right. And so it was federally funded and they didn't want to risk reintroducing the labels in case the litigation was going to be successful. So that is 
I think it's the first time um, that uh, somebody, uh, well, a group has tried to introduce very explicit warnings uh, related to cancer. So it was, it's, it's not a, a very powerfully designed study, but from the data that they, they, they managed to collect, they did see a decline in sales in the store that introduced it compared to the two control ones. And importantly, what they also saw was an increase in support for government policies to reduce alcohol consumption. And I think going back to what I was saying right at the beginning about how risk information doesn't change people's personal behavior to reduce the risk of being identified, risk information though can be very important in increasing the acceptability for general publics of government intervening to change uh, the environments that lead to the behaviours that undermine our health. Yeah, that's a very, very interesting angle, isn't it? You've made, you know, just reflecting on the uh, the battle that they had there with the industry, and you think what well, you think it took the Scottish government seven years to get minimum unit pricing through through all the courts, even going to the European courts and back to the Supreme Court. Because the industry just were desperate, desperate not to see something change, even though it wouldn't probably affect their profitability at all. The results of, of that, which were published, was it last week? So uh, there was a paper published in, in, in The Lancet. I think it was Peter Anderson was the first author. And what they were doing was looking at the longer term effects of minimum unit price in Scotland and the shorter term effects in Wales been introduced in Wales now and what they were able able to show using the Kantar uh, database is that a price the price increase was around seven eight percent I think by introducing the minimum unit price and uh, purchases decreased by a not dissimilar amount by about seven just over seven percent and they got similar so that's in Scotland where it's now been uh, a policy for two years. So they'd reported previously that there were short-term effects. So this is showing that it's a sustained effect and they've got similar effects in Wales. So it's really important evidence. Um, Absolutely. England has yet to declare. Uh, I, I think I, I, I recall hearing uh, government saying that England wasn't, they weren't planning to do anything in England. No, well, I think the drinks industry has... Um... It's worked out its strategies. It's a, it, it's much more efficient. It's an extraordinarily efficient lobbying organisation in Westminster. Uh, for the last few minutes, let's talk a bit about uh, about about obesity. Then, so you know, we know that uh, you just told us that some serving size people eat what's on the plate. So the bigger the serving, the more they eat. And yeah. of course, you know, we have Nouvelle Cuisine, and we all sneer at the fact you know you get two slivers of uh, of salmon plus a, a couple of sprigs of lettuce, and that's supposed to be how are we gonna how are we gonna deal with this obsession we have of bigger and more and and consumption of food. Yeah. Well, I think as with thinking about sales of wine bottles, a uh, proportion of prices, I think, is going to be quite a challenge uh, and going to be quite important. Um, I think it's, it's uh, I mean, it's the size of, of uh, as you say, of the food, as well as the, the nutritional content. Mm -hmm. Where to start, really? I, I mean, as we were saying earlier, we've got a size that's a large size, a size that's too big for our bodies, that's become normalized. So how, how, how do we uh, start to change that? I, I sometimes think that certainly with food, not the case for alcohol, that a lot of food is bought out of the public purse. And if you think about healthcare settings, council settings why why aren't we using those uh to model a healthy food environment so we spent a lot of time talking about you know whether or not to put a, a sugary drinks tax on sodas that were being sold in hospitals why don't we just sort of clear all that stuff out and have this as an environment where people can uh, begin to see what a healthy food environment is because I don't think any of us know really what that's like. You lost sight of it, yeah, yeah. And I guess, I mean, it was interesting how, I mean, the sugar tax, they did bring the sugar tax in and it was a 
against opposition from the industry. But again, I think it has has proved to be quite effective, and I think it's re well, certainly reduced the consumption of sugary drinks, hasn't it? Well, it was it was a levy that was introduced on those who were producing it, and the evidence shows that it, it's led to reformulation and a decrease in purchasing. Um, but it, it works quite well for that product. I don't know that reformulation is going to work, so it won't work so easily across the piece. But it does show, uh, importantly, that price-based interventions can be introduced and are effective. So I think, again, you know, the important thing is that there is no one thing, and it is about trying to implement a whole host of changes. And I, I think looking at the pandemic, there's, there's growing interest in looking again at the obesity strategy in certainly in the UK. And I, I think in other countries as well, as people appreciate that in, in the countries where obesity and overweight is very high, then the death rate from COVID significantly higher and people beginning to see that our vulnerability to infectious disease is also part of our vulnerability to the non-communicable diseases. And so beginning to bring those together, I think is going to be really important in terms of health policy. Yeah, having a having a sort of a common metric of of harms from tobacco and and alcohol and and obesity would be useful, wouldn't it? Some 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 measure that you can easily swing between the three. So people Whereas currently we think, well, you know, alcohol causes cirrhosis of the liver and obesity causes diabetes. But in fact, you know, A, there's a lot of overlap and B, you know, when no one quite, not even experts can really judge the relative dismerits of cirrhosis versus uh, versus diabetes. They're both, you know, so maybe we should try to have some kind of universal unit of harm. Well, talking about harm, so there's beta version of a new health index that uh -huh. Sally, Sally Davis uh, has been instrumental in facilitating from towards the end of her time as um, chief medical officer. And in fact, what it's generating an index that is looking at different components of health. So it's, it's looking at uh, not just at disease, but places, so healthy places. Yes, of so course. Looking at some of the behaviours, which are the risk factors, which is what you're talking about. So looking at all three. But critically, I think it's when we start to look at the interventions that can be effective. And certainly my own work and that of others is drawing attention to the fact that the interventions that work for food, not dissimilar to those that will work for alcohol and also for tobacco. So people sometimes talk about the three A's, you know, the affordability, the availability, the advertising. Obviously, there's a little bit more than that. But I think it's really helpful to start thinking that these are, um, as a behavioural scientist, I see them as our, it's our behaviour in relation to these. And we shape our behaviour in not dissimilar ways by changing no, quite, the quite. environments. Well, that's great advice. I hope you'll have more success in persuading the government to follow your advice than I've ever had. But I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure you will, Teresa. You've argued your case very well, and it's uh, it was great to talk to you. And wonderful experiments, challenging but real-world experiments that actually have a meaning. So, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much. <laughs>